And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. So I'd like to say my, my name is Nuan Das. I work as the director of API architecture uh, at WSO2. And my primary responsibility in WSO2 is to uh, basically take care of all the engineering that happens around uh, the API manager. And also, I'm uh, responsible for the rest of the, uh, the, the architecture uh, of the other products in the platform as well uh, as uh, being a part member of the architecture team. Uh, so today, uh, my session my, is to walk you through uh, of why we need API management and what we do in terms of API management and how we do it in the product. Uh, and finally, uh, on what our big bets are on the future and where we think the product should be going uh, and our investments into uh, some of these things that we believe are going to make a difference in the market. Um, so I'll start off with the whys and whats uh, to begin with. And then what I'll do is I'll go through a breadth, uh, breadth first um, uh, scenario of uh, API management trying to cover uh, the, the feature set or basically the capabilities that address the whys and whats uh, in the domain of API management. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, my intention. And finally, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the roadmap and basically what, what things we are working on in the future. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to ask the question, like, why uh, we need API management in the first place? Why is it so important? And uh, why is it a hot thing in the market right now? And the reason is because of this uh, scenario of app, app, app explosion. So uh, as you can see today, there are lots of lots of apps being uh, developed, uh, coming out. Uh, they could be like mobile applications, wearable devices, uh, your smart homes, and cars and everything, lots of stuff, right? So there are tons of applications being developed uh, and put out into the market. And why is this happening? Is because you and I, as consumers of data and services, we want convenience. We want to get things done faster. We want to get things done easier. We want to get things done cheaper. Um, and to be honest, we are all lazy people, right? We, we, I'm a lazy guy, and I just want to do, get everything done as fast as possible, as easy as possible, and you know, so that I can spend more time on vacation. But trust me, everything else builds up except for the vacation part. So um, that is the primary reason. The, the convenience and easiness uh, is what we as consumers are demanding from the market. So this demand is driving organizations to invest more and more into digital transformation. Because that experience is what is going to give the edge to organizations over all of its competition. So this demand for the digital transformation is making opportunity for revenue, is making opportunity for money, because we as consumers, as users of the data and services, are willing to pay for this convenience. And uh, so, so we are willing to pay, we are willing to invest on this convenience and easiness. And that is what is driving this entire force of digital transformation and the journey. And so digital transformation is all about building those experiences, building those connected experiences between system and giving convenience to its consumers. And the only way you can build this experience of these tons of connect uh, systems out there is through APIs. So APIs are the fundamental building blocks of building these experiences, of building these connections among these various components. And that is why they are, being, they, they are so important right now, because fundamentally, they are the ones that drive, that provide us that convenience, that, that easiness uh, that we are looking for in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. So that is why APIs are important. And if APIs are so important, then we need systems that are capable of organizing and managing APIs uh, in such a way that they can be consumed with uh, uh, optimum performance and optimum, optimum usage. So what are the things that you need then from an API management system? So we at WSO2 recently, uh, we wanted to sit down and try to figure out every possible scenario that our customers do with our product. Right? It, it, uh, the, the product <coughs> um, uh, is like, uh, more than six years, about six years old now, uh, and it has tons of features, grown a lot over the past few years, and there are tons of things that our customers do uh, with the product, right? It's not just with API Manager, but with the entire uh, platform. So we wanted to sit down and we wanted to uh, try and make a guest, make a list, list of every possible scenario that our customers do with the product. And so we sat down, and it was a bit of an ambitious project, uh, but we figured out. Uh, 
how to get this done. So what we did was we organized all of the stuff that, that our customers do through all the knowledge we have gained uh, through our support and community throughout the years. We organized everything into uh, things called scenarios and use cases. And we tried to figure out every possible scenario and every possible uh, use case we, uh, we organized in that way. And interestingly, in the, in the case of API management, everything that our customers did, everything that uh, the users of the product did, fell into one of these uh, five uh, categories. So everything that they did either fell into the category of either creating and publishing an API, or securing and rate limiting APIs, uh, something to do with consuming the APIs in some form. Uh, it, could, it fell either in the category of governance and lifecycle management, or uh, in the category of analytics um, uh, specialization and evolution of APIs. So all of the things that our customers do, there, there are lots of combinations, but at the end of the day, they fell into one of these uh, five categories. And what we also realized, interestingly, was that this had a great resemblance to something we are familiar with. And that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, uh, so Maslow identified the, the, the hierarchy of human needs, and he organized it in, in, a, in such a form of a pyramid, where right at the bottom, you have the uh, physiological needs, which are the basic needs for human survival. That is food, warmth, and rest. Uh, food, water, warmth, and rest. And on top of that, you need, humans need uh, security and safety assurances. And beyond that, humans need a sense of belongingness, a sense of love, and to be felt important in society. The interesting thing about this hierarchy is that you don't go into one level of hierarchy without accomplishing one of the, the, the previous levels of the hierarchy. For example, you, you don't become interested in belongingness and love if you don't have the basic needs for human survival, such as food, uh, water, rest, and warmth. Right? So similarly, uh, the, the fourth level is esteem needs. Basically, the need to be uh, a need to have a self of accomplishment, a need to have a self of importance in society. And finally, self-actualization needs. That is basically a realization of your full potential, a realization of your purpose of life, and then focusing on that particular area uh, um, that you really want to improve and optimize on, and then basically uh, uh, thriving on that particular area to reach your full potential. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this interestingly had a great resemblance to what we did in terms of uh, API management. So this is how I categorized them. So creating and publishing APIs could be categorized under the physiological needs of human uh, <coughs> survival, because that is the most primary, the basic thing that you need when it comes to API management. If you cannot have a mechanism of creating and publishing APIs, you can't really think beyond that. Security, securing APIs and rate limiting fell under the category of safety needs, similar to humans. And then uh, uh, consumability, being able to uh, find APIs, being able to uh, easily consume APIs, fell into the category of love and belonging. Because there's no point in having APIs, uh, secure and nicely designed APIs, if nobody can consume it or find it. Right? So APIs had the need to be found, the need to be uh, consumable. And that's where the uh, portals came in. Uh, and beyond that, the APIs had a need to be now governed and felt respected, assured that the proper standards are adhered to uh, when they are being consumed. So a governance and lifecycle management fell under the category of esteem needs. And finally, things like uh, analytics and uh, things like <clears throat> evolution and adaptation of APIs fell under the category of uh, self-actualization. And most uh, API management solutions out there are right now in this uh, last phase, realizing the last, uh, the, the, the last point. Basically, they are at the peak. So most API manage, mature API management solutions have now uh, um, gone beyond the basic and most primary uh, four needs of creating security, uh, um, governance, uh, and consumability. Not to say that there is no space for improvement, but uh, these have been accomplished now, <coughs> and uh, there are, of course, ways and uh, methodologies in which we improve each of those. But the, 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 the most providers are now focused on how we can, uh, how we can uh, realize the potential of our APIs uh, and thrive to achieve those uh, potentials. So 
So that's basically the what's of API management. And now I'd like to go in a breadth scenario of, uh, uh, to cover how each of these have been met with the product. Basically, the, the capabilities and the features that cover each of these sections. So to begin with, the first is obviously how to create and publish an API. So creating an API basically uh, simply means uh, creating a contract between the producer and the consumer. And how do you create that contract? There are various options. One is, of course, if you have <clears throat> already have a contract defined in an open API specification format, you can import that contract into the API manager and start creating your APIs. And if you don't have such a contract at hand, you can start from scratch by filling out the forms available uh, um, on the UIs. And also, uh, once you define the most uh, basic uh, stuff of APIs, like the name version and things like that, then you define your resources. And define your resources simply, again, means defining part of your contract. So you specify what input type this API consumes, what is the output type the, this API gives, what are the paths available, and what are the methods available, likewise. So this is basically, uh, in, at very brief, uh, how you define an API contract and the various options you have. And all of these capabilities are also backed by a RESTful uh, API. So these are like how you do stuff manually mostly, but if you want to programmatically create APIs, there are also uh, product APIs in the system, in the product, that which, uh, which you can consume if you want to programmatically create APIs in the system. And once you've created the API, the next is the documentation, how you describe your API to your consumers. So your documentation com can come in the form of an HTML document, a uh, web page basically, can come in the form of a PDF, a Word document, um, and, other, and other forms. So there are uh, ways, the <clears throat> as you can see here on the screen, where you can attach different types of documentation to your API. And once that is done, the next part is the publishing of it. So you've basically created your contract now, and the next is how you make this available to the outside world, make this discoverable to the outside world, and that is what we call the process of publishing. And when you publish an API, what basically happens is it becomes live. So there's a URL that you can access and, <clears throat> and all of that, right? It becomes a peer on a portal, so you can find it. Uh, so when you publish an API, there are two primary ways of publishing. One is you publish it for production use. And if you're not ready yet to go into production, you can publish it in the form of a prototype, where you can get the feedback of the community, uh, um, get your developers to test it, uh, and then iterate and publish. And also, when you publish, we have several options, such as um, if it's a new version of the API that you're publishing, to bring along all the older, the consumers of the older version into the new version, and also deprecate uh, the, the older version while you are publishing the uh, new version uh, likewise. Uh, so that's about the publishing part of it. And second, about the securing part of it. So uh, securing and rate limiting part of it. So uh, an API out there unsecured is uh, not good, right? So publishing actually, by default, happens in a secure way. So when you publish an API, by default, it becomes secured. So when talking about security, the API gateway is a primary point of enforcement of all the security rate limiting and other kinds of policies you have. So the fundamental way that we do security in API Manager by is by introducing a component called the gateway, which basically intercepts all of the requests that are going into, into your backend systems and applies all of the uh, policies available in the system, which could be like authentication, authorization, or rate limiting policies. So this is the fundamental architecture and mechanism of how it is done in general. And when talking about security, so there are various types of APIs. Some could be like APIs that are uh, published for internal consumption between uh, trusted subsystems. Subs so you could have APIs which are consumed by a handful of services within the organization, uh, and you know all of the consumers. It's just a few. And in those cases, you have options of using uh, mutual TLS-based authentication or even basic authentication for uh, securing your APIs. But more often than not, your APIs are being consumed by uh, applications, uh, uh, end-user applications. So this is where delegated authentication comes into place, because this is a situation where your application uh, owner or the organization and the API providing organization are like two different organizations, probably. Um, and they don't necessarily come from the same 
origin, and therefore you need to build mechanisms of how to do delegated authentication. Basically, how uh, you um, secure your APIs by not providing any of your users' credentials to your to the application that is consuming the APIs. So, uh, <clears throat> and how do you get your users to delegate their rights to an application to securely consume your uh, APIs? So that is basically where delegated authentication comes into play, and that is why OAuth 2 uh, plays a very important, a major role in uh, REST API security. And also authorization. So uh, beyond the authentication, then you have fine-grained authorization needs, such as just because you have a valid account doesn't mean you can do anything on the API, right? You may have fine-grained authorization needs, such as only a specific set of people are allowed to do write operations, and a specific set of people are allowed to do uh, read operations likewise. And there are also advanced rules, such as uh, doing allowing access to your services only between you know, 9 to 5, uh, on weekdays, so those kinds of five grand uh, authorizations can be achieved using technologies such as uh, the, the scopes of API uh, of OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, uh, and ZACML. And uh, cost or cross-origin resource sharing comes into the picture when you have APIs that are being accessed uh, by JavaScript uh, applications uh, that are running on different domains. So if your APIs are hosted in one domain and if they are being accessed uh, by JavaScript or browser-based applications operating on a different domain. A domain is basically uh, the host name uh, of your websites. And then web browsers, by default, apply this thing called the same origin policy, where it doesn't allow you to access resources across uh, origins. So this is where cross-origin resource sharing comes in. So these are also available as uh, capabilities to allow these kinds of uh, uh, exchanges on the platform. Um, and also, when it, like I said in the beginning, the reason, the primary driver for APIs is this explosion of apps. So apps are of different forms. There are multiple forms of applications, from wearable devices to mobile apps to web apps to cars to homes, a lot of things, right? So each of these applications have different characteristics. For example, JavaScript-based uh, applications are much less secure, whereas a web application running on a web server is much more secure, right? Because the JavaScript app runs on the client browser and the web application runs on a, a trusted enclosed system. So each of these applications have different characteristics. So to cater these different types of characteristics, we need different security mechanisms. And that is where this thing called grant types in OAuth, OAuth 2 comes into play. A grant type is a mechanism, a protocol, of how you get access to a system, how you get a credential, how you get a token, basically. So depending on the types of applications, there are different grant types, protocol defined, to suit each of those type of applications. And, and the good thing about uh, grant types, OAuth 2 grant types, is that uh, it's not a fixed set. So we have a fixed set uh, in the product coming out of the box, but the, the specification allows you to extend the available grant types as well as introduce new grant types if you want to suit different types of applications. Uh, so that's one great thing about the uh, OAuth 2 specification. And federated authentication. Again, we are increasingly seeing uh, applications uh, allowing you to log in through social media, log in through different identity providers, likewise. So this is also becoming a very important thing. And the, the fundamental concept behind this is you um, authenticate through a third party system, but you get credentials, you get tokens from your uh, local authentication system, which is the API manager. So federated authentication is also an important factor to consider, and these are also capabilities that are well, 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 available uh, on the lines of uh, securing APIs. Uh, now, when it comes to rate limiting, there are different types of rate limiting that are possible and that are important. One is, of course, quotas. So you, when, when an application subscribes to use an API, you give that application a quota. And so that quota doesn't mean uh, you get a fair usage across all of your users. There could be one user who is consuming the entire quota that belongs to the application. So you need fair usage policy. And then you need entry point control rules, such as to allow a high number of requests coming in from the internal network versus a lower number of requests coming in from the public internet, likewise. And also protection from over usage. So each application could have a defined quota, 
But what if you suddenly have a rise of applications and it causes all of your systems to be over-consumed, right? So you need to take all of these into account when designing these systems. Uh, and also custom policies. So these are the set of standard policies in terms of rate limiting that are available. But if you have requirements that go beyond these uh, standard rules, then you can define your own custom rate limiting uh, policies in the system. Um, and then f coming into API discovery and uh, consumption, so this is where the developer portal, the app developer portal comes into play. So first of all, you obviously need a way of uh, listing the APIs available in the system, and that's why we have a paginated way of listing all of the APIs through a developer portal. And of course, you can get them organized, grouped by tags uh, and other cataloging mechanisms. Um, and also having a very strong search capability, which allows you to search through API content, through resource content, through documentation content, and a lot of other things, which helps you to discover APIs much faster and consume them. And uh, it also needs, you also need capabilities of doing application management. So all of this we do to support our applications. So you need ways of defining your applications, of uh, ways of collaboratively developing your applications, getting credentials for your applications, et cetera. Uh, and consuming the API. So uh, when consuming the API, one of the, the, some of the most important things are how you can easily test the API. How can you easily uh, see how it looks like, right? So all of those testing tools are embedded into the portal. And uh, SDKs, which allow your app developers to quickly develop their application uh, through the libraries available through the SDKs, and also uh, developer tooltips. Uh, and when it comes to governance and lifecycle management, that's also one of the most important things, because this is what allows you to uh, standardize your API. So once you've gone beyond the one and two APIs in your organization, you need to standardize your APIs uh, and how they are used. So versioning plays a very important role. What are the different types of versioning allowed? Is it just through URL, through versions in the header, <coughs> uh, through versions in the, uh, uh, the, the query parameters? And when you introduce a new version, how do you seamlessly migrate the consumers of the older version into the new version? Right? So the platform allows you ways of doing that. If, you are, if the new version of your APIs is uh, backwards compatible, there are mechanisms which allow you to transparently migrate all of your older consumers, the consumers of the older version, into the new version without them having to touch the application code. And of course, the APIs have to be backwards compatible for that. So capabilities to run multiple versions in parallel, uh, transitioning your old subscribers to the new, uh, new version transparently, and also notifications. Whenever there's a new version out there, uh, we can notify uh, the, the subscribers to migrate over. Uh, then also custom life cycles. So the, the product comes to the default life cycle, but it has capabilities uh, to let you extend the life cycle if you want. Um, <clears throat> so this is the standard life cycle picture that you're seeing, but if you want to introduce new states, if you want to take off existing states and define what happens in each of those custom states, all of those are possible. Um, and then there are workflows which allow you to take control of what the, the, the actions happening in the system, such as when a state transition is happening, uh, how do you take control of it? How do you uh, make it go through an approval process? When a developer is signing up to the portal, how do you make him go through an approval process? So all of these are available in the form of uh, workflows uh, in the platform. Uh, and when you've got your API defined, now how do you move it? How do you uh, move it into a new environment? Right? So when, after you uh, deploy the API in your dev environment, you do all of your testing. And then once you're done with it, how do you plug this in into your CI CD pipeline? Uh, so that it gets promoted into your upper environment. So there's tooling available in the product which uh, allows you to do that. So as you can see, uh, the, the tooling comes in the form of CLI, which has commands to you know, export an API from a running system and then import it into a, a new system. Uh, these can be automated uh, through um, tools like Jenkins and all. And coming into analytics uh, and specialization, so analytics comes in two main forms primarily. They could be business insights, uh, which tell you how your APIs are <coughs> performing, which gives you indications of uh, the new expansions, potential expansions, like based on geographical consume, consumption, uh, based on promotions, where do you want to focus your promotions on, 
right? Uh, these business analytics or insights uh, help you to make those decisions, right? Uh, when do you end of life an API? These analytics can help you to make those decisions. What are the APIs that are doing well? What are the APIs that are not doing so well? And then there's the operational analytics, which tells you what is the response time of an API in average? What is the latency distribution? Which parts of the API are so easy, slow? Is it the backend system? Is it the authentication layer? Likewise. And then fraud and abnormality detection. For example, you're here in London today. If you're accessing a service uh, from here in London, and if you get a token here in London, and suddenly if this token is now being consumed, used in California, that's a scenario, probably a scenario where someone has stolen your token. So detecting these kinds of abnormalities and uh, fraudulent scenarios uh, are capable with our uh, operational analytics. And we are also seeing, uh, now we are getting into the peak of where we are seeing APIs specializing themselves and then evolving uh, into uh, other formats. So, uh, such as, so SOAP APIs are quite old, but we are now seeing things like uh, gRPC-based APIs, uh, event streams, which are uh, uh, fooling microservice developments, gRPC APIs, and we are also seeing this movement into micro gateways where APIs are slowly uh, transitioning themselves from the regular gateways into the micro gateways paradigm. So, uh, in terms of what's coming next, uh, so, like I said, we basically completed the basic four levels of uh, the, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs in, in the context of APIs. And the next is about how do we address the problem of trillion endpoints. So, if you were in Tyler's keynote yesterday, you would have listened to him and uh, heard him talk about how every function available in the world is transitioning itself into a programmable endpoint. So we are going to see a blast of programmable endpoints in the next uh, half a decade or so. So, uh, so this is all because uh, we are driving the, the, there's a demand for innovation, there's a demand for easy consumption, and how do we address this problem? So some of the big bets uh, <coughs> that we are making in terms of how addressing this problem is uh, <coughs> on developer-first APIs and micro-gateways. So uh, as you have seen now, uh, right now, what you have to do in order to get to an API runtime is you design the interface first, you make it go through a life cycle, and then you get the run runtime. But this doesn't really address the problem of uh, a situation of when you have like a trillion endpoints. You need uh, mechanisms where a developer can start with the runtime first, and then based on the outcome, make it available in API management systems. So we are investing into mechanisms where developers can start with the runtime first easily in a couple of minutes and then move in a bottom-up approach to API management system. And also uh, integration with service measures. So um, service measures have a neat way of addressing this uh, problem of an explosion of microservices. So they deal with, with uh, nicely uh, when it comes to uh, uh, inter-microservice communication and handling a huge load of microservices. So API management can play a really important role here because by filling in the API management gap in service mesh technologies. So we are investing into research of uh, in integrating with service mesh technologies. And also, we are building on things like uh, uh, <coughs> integrating with registry services such as etcd, uh, console, etc. And also dynamic APIs. So these are APIs that are short-lived, and based on the consume consumption of the API, they either uh, uh, um, adopt and evolve or they just die off. So we are investing into uh, how do we build these dynamic APIs? Uh, how do we uh, evolve them? How, how give a, a given API? How do we evolve it? Uh, into a proper API management and long-lived APIs. And interestingly, we are also uh, uh, seeing a trend, or rather a need for serverless API gateways, because this trillion endpoints uh, is causing the need of uh, uh, tons of uh, resources, right? So if we think of all of these endpoints as API gateways, we are talking about a lot of resources here. Each given unit can be a very small, can consume a very small amount of resources, but if you combine it all together, we are talking about a huge amount of resources. So interestingly, serverless API gateways will see a huge demand in the future uh, to cater this problem of a trillion endpoints, to cater this problem of a trillion uh, API gateways. Because they can be, if it's serverless, they can be brought up and down uh, based on necessity only. And also event-driven architectures are, are playing a huge role now in microservice development. 
but nobody has yet figured out what it really means to do API management in like event-driven architectures. Uh, so so far, API management is all about like point-to-point uh, HTTP-based communications, but what does it really mean to do uh, API management in this world is something that we are investing into. And one of the biggest bets that we are making is that we are seeing a trend where the whole world seems to be moving towards a cloud-based huge mammoth mainframe, where sometime in the, in the future, like people will no longer be developing uh, on their local workstations. They'll just be developing on the cloud only. So, uh, so like I said, the whole purpose of us doing API management is because of applications, is because of the need for applications. So what we are betting on is that API management should or would be a second class thing move in the future, in the sense that it won't die off, but it'll be a native thing. Like people won't think of it as, a, as an additional thing. They would be, it should be embedded into application and service uh, development. So right now we think of API gateways and all as an additional step to application development of, of our service exposure. But moving forward, uh, we are thinking that API management is going to be a, a native thing where when you declare and design your application and services, API manager just becomes uh, embedded. So uh, Tyler mentioned the same thing yesterday. He used the word uh, batteries included uh, when, he, when he talked about this. So this is what he meant. So that means your service development and all in the stuff uh, in the future will be API management enabled by default without uh, us developers having to do anything extra. So uh, that covers uh, my presentation. So it was a bit fast because I wanted to cover the entire breadth as fast as possible. I hope it had been useful. And I'm about one minute short. So if you have any questions, please do meet me. I'm here today and tomorrow till the end of the conference. And thank you.